Uh, verse number 10, I'm going to read it one more time, and then I'm going to talk to you a little bit about, uh, about being ransomed. And the ransomed of the Lord shall return, and the ransomed of the Lord shall return. I love this here. I preached a couple weeks ago uh, on a Sunday night about uh, God hearing our sighs, and he, hear, he hears us. And it said, look at this. It says, sorrow and sighing shall flee away. And uh, side note, how many times during the week do you sigh? How many times do you ever do that, Brother Hurry? I sigh out to God. I'm just like, oh, God, help me, or something like that. And, and he hears that, and the Bible is clear that he hears that, and he listens to you. But all that's going to be gone. You won't be sighing up in heaven. It won't be any sorrow. All that stuff will flee away. You won't have to sigh about your brother, about something he said, or your sister in Christ, something they did, or something one of your kids did, or your family did, or something that happened. You won't have to sigh about those things anymore because it will flee away. And the ransomed of the Lord shall return. Shall return. How glibly we pass away over certain words in the Bible, I think. Ransom means a price that was paid. It means that someone paid a price. It means someone that was being held hostage, someone's being held against their own will. And if you have any sin in your life, or if you've ever sinned, which I'm a sinner, and I, I've done tons of sins, I, I've committed tons of sins, I sin every day, and I, I try to get victory over it. It seems like when I get victory over one, I, I neglect another, and I can't get victory over that. And it seems like we're held against our own will. And if you've had any sin that you can't get over, if you've had a sin that you can't conquer and you cannot defeat, believe me, you're held ransom. You're held against your will. Will. If it was up to you, you would never do that. You would never try to do those things. You'd never allow yourself. If you were in your right mind, you would never do those things. If you were, had enough sleep, if you had enough strength, you'd never do those things. You'd never stop and do those things. But how many times we look over those things, and when I think of being ransomed, I think about a price being paid. How glibly we pass over certain words that our Lord said. He said such as, it is finished. He said that on the cross. You know, he spoke four times on the cross as he was going through that intense pain and as he was dangling up there, as he was put up on that cross to pay for our sin's debt. And one of the things, the last thing that he said was that it, it is finished. And I've often wondered, what does he mean it's finished? Does it mean his life's finished? Does it mean this? When I was, when I was young, when I was a, a baby Christian, I was often wondering, what does that mean? What is he talking about? And how, how many times we look over just those words there where we say, it is finished. How glibly we pass over certain passages like 1 Corinthians chapter 6, where it says, you're not, bought, you're not your own, you're bought with a price. Your price was paid for you. That's when I get offended. That's when I get mad at people with the way they act and the way that they live. Don't you understand that a price was paid for you? Now, I'd like to talk to you this morning about that price. Now, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on the crucifixion, even though I could just show you a bloody, bloody mess, and I will get there towards the end of my message. But there are so many things to this being paid for, bought by a price. There's so many things that God went through. There's so many things that Jesus went through. Man, if you're a father today, man, if you're a mother today, if you're a parent, you know what I'm talking about when your kids, when you watch them go through things and you watch them do things and you watch certain things happen to them and it pulls at your heart and it breaks your heart when you know that someone that you love even has to go through certain things and how it must have tormented God Almighty knowing that what his son had to go through. Well, he could have stopped it. You don't understand. We serve a sovereign God that is a God of his word and once he says something he has to do it once he's so pure and so holy that our mind can't comprehend how good he is and how great he is and how mighty he is and he has to do what he says you're not bought with a price what i'm saying is people don't get it you know sometimes i can get mad and i can get down why people don't come back to church and why people don't read their bible and people don't pray and people don't decide this but it's not up to me it's up to the holy spirit and he's going to draw them, and he's going to do it. But I'm just telling you right now, those people, that, these people that are in this auditorium, you here this morning, I'm going to try to show you the price that was paid so that you can sit here. So that you can sit here free from sin, born again, washed in the blood. I'm going to show you that price. And if you've never been born again, if you've never been trusted Christ, this is the morning that you need to do it. You need to change your life this morning. And I'm telling you, God will do it. I'd like to talk to you this morning about the price that was paid for our ransom. The ransom for the Lord. I'm telling you, if you talk about a ransom, if you talk about getting on an easy payment plan, you see all these things where there's so many payments where you can buy these DVDs and you can buy all these things and you can make installments, they call them. They're little payments that you make so you don't have to pay it all at once. And I'm telling you, all through the Bible, God was making installments on our behalf. He was paying our debt little by little and he could have paid it all. But I'm telling you, there's, there's little installments that he made. God saw that man had sinned, and with that sin, man had pulled down the entire human race. 
In Genesis chapter 3, 15, God said someday the seed of woman would bruise the head of the serpent. And that the head of the serpent would bruise the heel of the seed of woman. That, that, he, that, that this was going to happen. He, he prophesied. He told the future. He told you what was going to happen. God is a man of his word. God is a God of his word. He is a supreme being. And he made a public announcement. He made a public announcement to everybody on earth. He said someday that that serpent is going to bruise the, bru, bruise the seed of woman. And that's what he was talking about. He was talking about Jesus Christ. He knew that someday that Christ would have to come. And Christ would have to pay sin's debt. He saw that. He saw the future. And no matter how bad it broke his heart, and no matter how much it kind of, he winced just a little bit, if you will, at how, what his son was going to go through, he knew that he had to. Someday, he said, there's going to be a Calvary. Someday, there's going to be a cross. Someday, there's going to be a, be a paid in full. There's, there's going to be a payment made in full someday. And I'm going to have to make that payment. And my son's going to have to make that payment. See, God and Jesus, they were up there. They've been up there fellowshipping since the beginning of time. That's what we can't fathom. We can't fathom how big God is and how mighty God is. They were up there fellowshipping. They were before. They were before us. They were. I am what I am. They were there since the beginning, since the foundations. In the beginning was God. He was always there. Him and Jesus were fellowshipping. They were loving on one another. They were having a good time. I don't know why they created us sometimes, and I can't even get into that today. But I'm just telling you, they had that fellowship, and he knew that someday he saw the future. And he knew that someday his only begotten son would have to be nailed on a tree called Calvary to pay for our sin's debt. Someday that was going to happen. That moment when God made a public announcement that his son would be given for payment for sin. That's the first payment. That's the first installment of our ransom. God made that public announcement. He made it. He told people, this is what's going to happen. I'm a God of my word. I'm going to have to come through it. This is how it's going to have to go down. In Genesis 3, when God killed that animal... And when God killed that animal and to put the skins, the coat of skins on Adam and Eve because they were naked, when God took that animal and God slit that animal's jugular and that blood went all over the ground, no doubt God Almighty in his heart saw that and saw that animal being sacrificed to cover their sin. And he thought, someday, someday in the not so distant future, my son is going to have to be that lamb. My son is going to have to do what that animal did. And that's my son is going to have to die to pay for Sin's debt. He's going to have to pay for people's sin. People that don't even know him. People that don't even care about him. People that could care less about him. He's going to have to pay their debt. And I'm going to do that by he's going to have to lay his body down and lay his life down to die for their sins and make payment for their sin. When Abraham journeyed three days and three nights to Mount Moriah to offer Isaac, God was saying to us, his beautiful son would lie in the grave for three days and three nights. That's what he was saying. Okay, God was paying, paying his first payment. He was paying his first installment. He knew that someday that my, my son, that innocent lamb, is going to have to die for the sins of the world. That's what he was saying. Every time one of those things would happen in the Bible, every Passover lamb, every beautiful little Passover lamb, with no blemish, with no spot that was perfect, Every time they took and they cut the jugular of one of those lambs, every time the basins were filled and they put the, the blood over the doorpost and that death angel came through, every single Passover lamb, 10,000 of them, every single one he saw up there from heaven being sacrificed, every single one of them he saw about him, about him being given to cover sins, he thought, someday my son's going to have to do that. Someday that's going to be my son. And I'm telling you right now that God thinks of this altar as a special place. Okay, and you think you got a problem, and that's what I'm trying to tell you. People, well, what's the big deal about going to the altar? It's special to God. He saw them lambs being sacrificed. He saw them being laid down on the altar. God sees it when you come up and you say, I'm going to lay this sin on the altar. I'm going to lay this problem up here. I'm going to lay up here and pray, and I'm going to talk to you about it. God sees that. Well, God hears me from my seat. Yes, he does, but God's watching, and he sees it when you make a move. He sees it when it's important to you. And I'm just telling you, God's looking for something. He's looking for you to make a move. And all those lambs that were killed, God knew that someday my son's going to be my son. Up there in heaven, he winced, winced a little bit. I'm not trying to make him human and trying to make him be like a, a softy, but I'm telling you, there, God's got a heart. And God created us in his own image, Okay? So if he created us in his own image, 
and my heart breaks for my kids, then you better bet that his heart breaks for his kids. And you better bet that his heart winced a little bit when he knew what Jesus was going to have to go through to pay for his sin. He winced a little bit because of that. He kind of, oh, that's going to hurt. Every little lamb that was pierced and killed, God's heart was pierced and killed because that lamb knew that would become the lamb of God, which was his son. Every time they killed an animal at the tabernacle, every single bullock that they sacrificed, every single lamb that they sacrificed without blemish, every single dove that they, they popped its head off and, and sprinkled the blood in a basin, every single one of those animals that they sacrificed, God saw that. And God knew that someday that his son, I'm trying to talk to you about a price that was paid. Okay, I'm trying to talk to you about the torture that God went through before Jesus even got on that cross. That's what I'm trying to say. I'm trying to show you the God that we serve. I'm trying to show you the God that loves you so much that he wants you to come and accept him as your savior. That's what I'm talking about. Why do I get up here and preach? Why do I do all these things? Because I love that God that sacrificed that much, so much in the future that I want, I want to love him and I want to serve him. He loved me first. And that's why I love him. And I can't help it. And maybe I'm nuts and maybe I'm crazy, but I just love him. And I don't care what people think of me or what they say, but I'm always going to love him. I'm always going to serve him. And I'm going to try to introduce as many people as I can to him. But I'm just telling you that if you want to talk about torture, you want to talk about something that went on the cross. For years, God had to watch this going down. For years, he had to watch all this happening, and he had to deal with it. And every time he saw it, he was reminded. And you can think of something that's happened in your mind. You can think of something that's happened in your heart. And how one little thing, I didn't even think about it yesterday, but we were driving, me and Tina, and she saw a billboard about hips being replaced. So she immediately thought about my dad. I didn't see it. I didn't think of it. I'm personally going through a season now with my dad to where I'm okay. Okay, I got right this week, Brother Bob. God convicted my heart, and I said, hey, he's not dead. He is not dead. He changed addresses. I feel good. I've been brokenhearted for a long time, brother, where I can't even look at his stuff or think of his stuff, and I just start crying. Okay, but I finally got to a place. But I'm just telling you, you're going through something in life, and you're ha something's happening. There's going to be things that's going to trigger something in your mind. And I'm telling you that every single time that them lambs were sacrificed, every single time that bullock was sacrificed, every single time he saw that blood, his mind raced back to where uh, ahead, to where he knew that his son was going to have to be sacrificed someday. You want to talk about some torture? You want to talk about some hurt? God Almighty knows how you feel. He knows exactly how you feel, and he's been doing it for years and he watched his only begotten son die on that cross when the blood was placed on the ear of the of the priest and on their hand and on their foot god knew that that same blood that would was found would be the thought of his precious son and the blood that he had given when the leper was cleansed when moses held up the serpent high the serpent that was held up high when jonah was in the belly of the whale god was saddened every time that he saw a symbol of his son what he was going to have to go through all through the Old Testament, all through those, those things we call Bible stories, all those real events that happened. He lived through those. He saw those. Every time he saw those, he was forced to think about his son and what his son had to do. He almost dreaded it, kind of, I wonder, if he didn't dread what his son had to go through. But it had to be because in the beginning, he made that public announcement that this is what's got to happen to pay sin's debt. And I'm a God of my word, and I'm a God that means what I say. He looked down and knew that someday his son who he had fellowship all through eternity, would have to suffer a cruel, poor death, like a thief, like a robber, like a liar, like a cheat. He knew that someday his son would have to suffer that. And he kept going. He kept thinking about it. He always had to see that. I'm talking about the price that he had to make. That was the first installment. The second installment came in Bethlehem. Bethlehem. I think that's another word that we just cr go over and we don't even give Bethlehem its due till around Christmas time. You understand what went down in Bethlehem? Do you understand? I'm telling you, I'm preaching to me as much as I'm preaching to you. Do you understand the significance of what happened in Bethlehem? In one moment, he went from having fellowship with God Almighty, with being the king of glory, with being up there having all the riches and everything he could ever want. He's God. He's God's son. And in one moment, he went from that to the, to the outhouse. He went from that palace to the, to the barn. He went from living in there, having sheets and, and bedding and, and just things that were great to have to living down here on the streets. He went from streets of gold to streets of mud. 
Do you see what he did? He did that for me and you. That's the second installment. Man, I'm not talking about the cross. I'm talking about the other stuff that would turn me and you around and have us spinning in every different direction because we couldn't stand it. God Almighty did that, and he did that at Bethlehem. He went from the palace to an outhouse. He exchanged a robe for a piece of burlap. You understand what I'm saying? You ever worn a piece of burlap? You ever felt a piece of burlap? It's like sandpaper. And he went from those silky robes to those nice linens to burlap. He did that for us. He did that for me. Man, I love him for doing that for me. Somebody willing to do that for me. That does something to me, brother, and it better do something to you. He was willing to do that for you because he loves you. Okay? He loves you. I'm so tired of people not realizing how much he loves them. He exchanged the lights of glory to the darkness of a barn. I bet you there weren't even lights in there. We got lights at mom's barn. You flick on one switch and there's two little bulbs and it's so dark in there you can't even see. They didn't even have electricity. You can't put a light in a barn, okay? They're straw. It catches fire. But he went from, from, from the lights of glory, he went down to a barn, the darkness of a barn, the smell of a barn. That's what he went to. He did that for us. Well, I wouldn't move out of my house for anybody else. I wouldn't do this for anybody else. I'm talking about suffering. I'm talking about paying a price that you can't even comprehend. Not alone on Calvary's Hill, but I'm talking about the other price that he paid. He went from omnipotence to a babe dependent on his mother for everything. Man, talk about humbling, brother. He went from having, being able to do everything and get everything for himself to dependent on a mother to meet every single need. He did that for me and you. He went from gold streets to muddy path. He went from the monarch to eternity to the being obedient to the flesh. You understand that? The flesh was pulling him. He was a man. He came in the form of man. He sweat. He stank. He got hungry. He never got hungry before. He never got thirsty before. He did that for me. He did that for you, brother. That's what I'm talking about. He went through that suffering. That's suffering enough. Yesterday, me and Miss, me and Miss Tina, we kind of went out on a, a weekend away, kind of a date, and we didn't eat till like 3 o'clock in the afternoon. And man, I was starving. I was starting to get grumpy, but I was trying not to show her that I was grumpy. But man, God went through all this, and he had went, got hungry. And he didn't get grumpy once. He didn't get, I'm sure it was just tearing him up, being hungry. But he went through all those things. When you look at Calvary and the price for, paid for your sins, don't forget about Bethlehem. When the father waved goodbye to his son, and the son waved goodbye to his father, and left that which was eternal and went to that which was temporal. I'm telling you, he waved goodbye to him. I'll see you again, Dad. I'll see you later. I got to go down here. I got to go down here for 33 years. I got to go down here and do this. I'll see you later. I love you. I love you, Dad. I love you too, son. Be careful. Take care. I love you. And I'm telling you, it's a father's love. He went through that for me and you, brother. He went through that for me and you, sister. He loves you. Will you not worship him? Will you not serve him? Will you not try to get other people to meet him? Will you not throw in with me and help me to try to build a work for him? Will you not try to live the straight and narrow path for him? After all he's done for you, you won't give up nothing for him. After all he's done for you, you won't do anything for him. I'm just telling you, follow him. Love him. Obey him. Have a walk with him. Talk to him. Pray with him. Love him. After all he's done for us. He that knew no sin became sin. He that had all the riches and glory became poor. Let me tell you, folks, amidst all the amens and all laughter out there, there ought to be a time where some preacher sits you down on some Sunday morning and tells you what he went through, what he did, what he did for, to pay for your sin's debt, all the things, all the little things that he went through, all the big things that he went through. He sacrificed a lot. I'm telling you, don't forget the price that was paid for you when you're out there doing something and you're out there being selfish. Man, don't be selfish. Somebody paid a price for you. They worked hard for you. They did this for you and that for you. Don't throw it away. Don't waste it. Don't give in. Don't quit. Jesus paid it all. All to him I owe. He paid it all. Every bit. That's what they're talking about. For years I thought, Brother Harry, he's talking about Calvary and he's talking about this and he gave his life. Look at all the other stuff he did. All that is just, this is icing on the cake. But look at all the other stuff that he did for us. All those things. Man, if you get into it, brother, it's humbling. It's humbling to see what he did for us because he loved us so much. All God, God became flesh. He was, he was God and he became flesh. He was who rich, he became poor. He who was perfect, became sin. He who was God, became man there in Bethlehem in the major. The second installment was paid for our ransom, was paid in Bethlehem. 
That's what I think is the most exciting thing. We're coming up on the Christmas season. We're going to come up in a couple months. It's going to be Christmas. You're going to think about Christmas. You're going to think about that. Think about what God did just coming to earth. Okay? I'm not talking about the cross, and I'm not belittling the cross. The cross is where it's all happened. Calvary is what, what will always be the, the emblem that I'll hold up. Calvary, that old rugged cross, is what I'll hold up as a Christian, as a Baptist preacher. That's what I'll hold up. But I'm just telling you, just by the matter of fact of him coming to earth, and how humbling that must have been for him to do that, for me and you, and for God to look and see all those times, see all those lambs being killed, and think about his son and what he was going to have to go through. Man, that's a price that was paid. The third installment was made in a cavern-filled mount. For 40 days and 40 nights he had eaten no food, and he entered no food and entered into his stomach. Satan says, hey, you see those stones over there? I know you're hungry. I know you're starving. I know your belly's growling. Take those stones over there and make them bread. And he didn't do it. He didn't give in to it. Then he took him to the pinnacle of the temple, which was half a day's journey. Took him half a day's journey to the pinnacle of the temple. Hadn't eaten anything for 40 days, 40 nights, fasted. And then he took him over there. And he had him, told him, I dare you to jump off. You're so God's son, jump off of here. I dare you to jump off there. He knew that if he jumped, an angel would catch him. He knew that he would have to, that an angel would catch him. He knew that he had that power to do that. He knew that he was the son of God and the king of kings. Here he was, yielding himself, as it were, if you would, it to the devil, listening to him, even giving him audience, because he knew that if he didn't go to Calvary, we'd have no hope. Amen. He knew that if he didn't put up with all this nonsense, we'd have no hope. He knew that if he popped the devil and showed who he was and stomped him and throw him down in a pit, he knew that we would have no hope. He knew that if he fast-forwarded to all that, we wouldn't have any hope. He did that for me, brother. He put up with that loudmouth devil. He put up with that whiner. He did that for me. That does something for me. When somebody puts up with that, when somebody puts up with stuff, think back to what your mom put up with. Think back to what your dad put up with. Think about what they did. Think of those hours that they worked, that money they invested. Think about that. And I don't care what kind of mom and dad you had, but think about the labor that she went through just to have you in that delivery room. Okay, I know none of you came out of a test tube, so I know all you had a mama. But I'm just telling you right now, that's what I'm saying. Think about what they went through. And then think about what Christ went through for you. Okay? Think about what he went through for you. Amen. The stuff that he put up with. The stuff that he did. Listen to all them disciples think they know his word. Listen to all them preachers think that they knew his word spouting off in the temple. Man, I would have... We can't hold our tongues. We're man. Somebody says something wrong, we got to tell them. We got to show him. Here he is. He created it all. He made it all. Wrote the book, was there when it got penned, everything. And he had to sit and listen to him butcher his word. He had to sit and listen to him teach false teachings and was able to keep his tongue because he knew that he had an appointment at Calvary. And if he bypassed that appointment, this guy right here has got no hope. Those kids right there got no hope. Kenny and Gavin got no hope. Toby and Dakota got no hope. We got no hope. If he doesn't make it to Calvary. If he doesn't make it to Calvary, we got no hope. We got no hope. We got nothing that we can trust in. If he would have given into that temptation, there would have been no hope. Next installment was paid at the synagogue in Nazareth. It was his home church. It was his home church. There's something about going back to your home church. Being able to preach at your home church, the church you came out of. Unfortunately, I will never have that opportunity. I have had that opportunity of faith, but had things worked out right the way they should have, uh, maybe uh, uh, they would have worked out a little different. I would have went back to my home church. But I'm saying that to say this. There's something special about going back to your home church and being able to preach. And here he was, the guy raised up in Nazareth. He finally gets to the age where he's, get, he's starting his ministry. He's just starting his ministry. Man, I'm going to go back to the synagogue where I spent every Sunday at, where I spent every Sabbath day at. And no doubt they brought him in and they said, man, here he is. Here he comes. Here comes our little preacher boy. He's going to come up. And then he stood him up in front of all of them. And he said this. He said, hey, you remember all those times you read the Old Testament to me? And all those times you talked about a Messiah. I want you to sit down. I want you to just hang on to your pews for a minute. I want you to listen to me. That Messiah, that Messiah is me. Okay? I'm the Messiah. 
I'm the one that I, they've been preaching about. I'm the one that you've been telling about. And automatically that priest, that, that rabbi jumped up and said, that's blasphemy. And they ran him out of church. And they threw him off on the side of the hill. And they kicked him out of town. He went through that for me and you. He went through that humility. He went through that no one loving him. No one caring for him. Everybody hating him. Man, they don't like me. Man, they don't like me. We get our feelings hurt. He went through that for me and you. Nobody liked him. Everybody despised him. The people that should have loved him couldn't stand him. He came to his own and his own knew him not. He did that for me and you so that we could get saved, so that we could trust him as our Savior, so that one day we'd have a home in heaven in eternity. That's what he did for me and you. That's what he took. He took his beating. He took his lumps. The next payment was made on the Mount of Olives. He prayed to God and he asked God to, to let this cup pass from him. He said that the foxes have holes and the birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man have not where to lay his head. Can you imagine for three years, for his ministry, for three years, he had no place to live. He had no place to lay his head. He had no place to shelter his body from the elements. He had no one that was willing to tell him how much they loved him and tell him, give him words of encouragement. He had no place to anyone to do that. How nice it is just to have words of encouragement and just know that someone loves you and they care for you. How nice that is. For three whole years he went that way where nobody loved him. Nobody liked him. People couldn't stand his preaching. Nobody gave him any words of encouragement. They wanted to run him out of town everywhere that he went for preaching the truth. He did that for me and you, brother. He did that for me and you, sister. He paid that installment. He paid that. Paying that payment for salvation. Okay, no family to encourage him. No bed to sleep. No house. And he was despised for three years because he was paying for our salvation, paying for our sin, ransom. The next payment was that little room where he had fellowship with the fellows. His fellows, he talked about the disciples. And he said, hey, fellas, I'm going. I got to go somewhere. And Thomas said, where are you going? How, how will we get there? How will we know the way? He said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. He knew in just a few hours that Judas would, would, would betray him with a kiss. He knew that in a few hours they would come and take him to the high priest. And then they would take him from there to, to Herod. And then they would take him from there to Pilate. And then they would take him back to the high priest. He knew that all this would happen. He knew in just a couple of hours all these things were going to go down. He knew that his beautiful back that had not a single mark on it, not a single blemish, not a single scratch. He knew that soon that his back would have the cat of nine tails hitting on it. He knew that he would have to put the weight of the cross on his shoulders. That's what I'm saying. He knew all that was going down. And he still did. It because he loves you and he loves me. He knew all those things. I'm talking about a price being paid this morning. He knew that all these things would happen. He knew in just a few hours that he would go up Golgotha's hill and he would bend under the weight of that cross. And 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 and, and they would send Simon Peter, Simon to help him, Peter, and they would they, they would they would send him to help him. And he knew that he had to bear the cross and nail him to the cross. He knew that they would do that. He became a drunkard for drunkards. He became a harlot for harlots. He became a thief for thieves and a beggar for beggars. He did all that for me and you. He did all that for us. Knowing what he was going to go through. Knowing in those hours. And then he took those hands. Those hands that were clean with no scars. And he took a basin and he took a towel and he sat down. And he washed the feet of the disciples. That humbling act that he did, he knew that was happening in a couple hours. Yet he did all those things. He did all this for us. He knew that God would turn his back on him. He knew that he would say, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? He knew that, but yet he still went. He looked out at the twelve and he said, fellas, I'm going to leave. But if I leave, I go, I go and prepare a place for you, as John chapter 14 says, and I'll come again for you. He knew that that was going to happen. And then he washed their feet. We don't sit this, here this morning because we're good. We sit here this morning because the ransom was paid. I can sit in church today because somebody paid my debt. Okay, they paid my sin's debt. Not because I'm a good person, but because I accepted that as payment. And because I was accepting him. When Peter cursed him, his heart was pierced just like when we curse him and we don't stand for him. And we curse God's name. That's how his heart was pierced. Then he had 39 stripes and he was so bad that they didn't even know... What kind of person he was? What are you beating over there on that rock? What is that? Is that a man? Is that an animal? They didn't even know what it was. And then they played a game. We played uh, cowboys and Indians. They played king. They took a crown of thorns and put it on his head. And they took a hot, scratchy robe after his back had been all tore up. And they put that on. And then they put a sign around his neck, King of the Jews. They were making fun of him. They were playing a game. They were playing kings. They were playing that game. And they were making fun of our Savior. And then he had, he said, I, I thirst. 
from those lips. Can you imagine that his mom saw? What his, what his mommy saw? She saw those lips. He used to say, I love you, mommy. I love you, daddy. I'll be careful, I promise. I love you so much. Those same lips were saying, I thirst. Those same lips, those feet that she taught to walk, those feet that she had tied his sandals and got him ready for school or sent him out to the workshop to help dad. She saw those feet with that nail pierced through both of them. Those beautiful feet she saw. That ransom was paid. We were bought back. What he was trying to say, what he was trying to say, the next words that he said, what it, was, it was finished. What he's trying to tell you is clear back in Genesis. Those things that were started, all those times that my heart was broken and all those things that God saw and all those things, that's what's finished. That's what he's talking about. I've finished the end of that. That's what he's saying. I've paid sin's debt. I've paid for you. I don't understand why we can see that and we can see what he went through. And I'm not even talking about the cross. I'm just talking about the sheer torture that God went through. If I could just get you to love him a little bit more. If I could just get you to serve him a little bit more. If I could just get you to show him how much you love him. If I could just get you to believe that he did that for you. He did that for me. Why can't we love him? Why can't we trust him as our savior? Don't do this to him. Don't do it. Love him. Worship him. Praise him. Make him a part of your life. Look what he did for you. He did this for you because he loves you. All those things. And I didn't even have to show the cross that much. I'm just talking about the other things that he did for me and you. Because he loved us so much. All the stuff that he went through. All the things that he went through. And how many things we'll go through for people. But there's certain things that we just won't do. And certain things that we won't go through. But what he was willing to, to go through for us. And we need to take that and get our lives in check and say, Hey, if he was willing to do that for me, what can I do for others? Maybe I'll give up a little time for soul winning. Man, it's nothing. Hour and a half a night? Hour, two hours on Saturday? That's nothing. I'm not going to give a little time for Sunday night, come back to Sunday night or Sunday morning, Sunday school. You do what you want, brother, but um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to serve somebody that loved me that much. I'm going to come to somebody that loved me that much. Maybe you're here and you're lost. Maybe you've never trusted him as your Savior. You don't even know what I'm talking about. You don't even care what I'm talking about. What I'm telling you is trust him. Trust him as your personal Savior. Make him Lord of your life, okay? The world has no hope. I'm so, I'm so over trying to give people false hope. I think that's where I'm at. Either you're saved or you're not. The Bible says, it's very clear, if you don't get saved, if you don't trust Christ as your Savior, then you will live forever, but you'll live forever in hell, a place called hell, ever-loving ever torment, ever, everlasting torment, not ever-loving, everlasting torment, Burning, gnashing, wailing of the teeth, want a place that you don't want to go. And that's where I don't want you to go. And I don't want you to go there. So if you are not saved, if you've never trusted Christ your Savior, and you need to. You need to. You know how hard it is to preach a funeral of someone that doesn't know Christ? Yep. And you've got to give the family hope and let them know that, hey, everything's okay. You know how much easier it is, Kenny Walker, to preach about a guy that's saved? I know where he's at. I know what he's done. Don't worry. You don't have to worry about where he's at. You're going to go see him. He just went somewhere else. But I'm just telling you right now, it's so much harder when they're not saved. Don't do that to me. Well, don't preach my funeral, preacher. Some preacher's going to have to preach your funeral. I won't have a funeral. Do whatever. Be that way. Be a big baby. I don't care. What I'm telling you is get saved. Trust Christ. It's the easiest thing to do. Let's pray.